I look back at those days now, I realize that the valley really was a frontier at that time. But Palmer was the center of the place, the center of activity. Wasilla and anywhere west of here was pretty much unpopulated. It was a very small town, but I remember the beauty of the mountains and just standing, and it was magical to see it. It was a farming and a coal mining community. There probably wasn't more than 1,200 people living in the whole area. I think phone service really knit the community, just pulled it together. I came in 1947. The phone company before that was a private enterprise, Maynard Sands, and he had to work with a minimum of money, so he couldn't repair lines, and sometimes we'd drive down our street. I live a mile from here in North Palmer, and we'd drive down the street, and sometimes we'd have to have one of the kids to hold the line up over the car or else flatten it out on the ground to run over it. That was the first telephone. People were using, uh, and I remember it well, people using old surplus army field telephones with, with the, mil the military wire strung along the ground and along fence lines and over to some place. It was kind of haywired and hung on the fence post and the light poles and was an operator system. You got in financial problems and the city of Palmer bought the system and they were operating the telephone system when the group got together and formed the cooperative MTA. It was Lou Hanks. I know he headed up the group and was the first president of the board to organize. Everybody had a vision maybe and saw a need. There was definitely a need for improved communication throughout the valley and in particularly in the Wasilla Palmer area where it was, uh, the population was beginning to uh, grow. We'd go up to the experiment farm to use the old ACS line, and it was connected to the railroad. And whenever the railroad had a problem with the phone system, they just cut off all the other lines. So I'd go up there and there'd be no phone, or there might be one. Try and call a doctor or a hospital or something. It was fairly obvious, I think, to anybody who looked at that time that we needed a, a modern communication system. I was working for a company out of uh, Chicago, Illinois, living in Indiana and installing telephone equipment all over the United States. And they assigned me to come to Alaska to install the first dial telephones in the valley area. I was a small town boy from southern Indiana, uh, but it was still a little, little shock. Uh, getting here in January and the wind was blowing and it was cold. I was approached after I'd been here and got to know some of the people a few weeks if I was interested in going to work for Matanuska Telephone at that time. And I, I not only said no, I said hell no way, you know, that's just it. But things changed, you know, I got to know the people and understood, you know, what was happening here and decided to uh, take the job that they, they offered me. So when I got the, all the equipment installed and ready to turn over to them, I went to work for MTA. I think there were five of us all together. The offices were in downtown Palmer, and a Severn's building, most people are familiar with the old time, it's a borough building now. When I first came there in uh, 57, I guess it was, there was Edna Johnson was in the office, he's a bookkeeper. Max was back in his office as a manager. Marn Hanks was the office manager. Then we had uh, Bill White and uh, Hal Chance on the outside. My first job when I <laughs> went to work for MTA was to uh, put together, I think it was a $40,000 loan, just to, so we had enough operating capital to meet payroll, yes. We struggled for a long time, and uh, 
trying to get people to, uh, you know, sign up. It was forty dollars equity and a ten dollar membership, and a lot of people that didn't have that, and we had to encourage them over the years, and we had. To, the fire department urging people, you know, for fire protection, particularly in Chugiak and Eagle River and Rosella, to join up so they could report their problems to the fire department. And we would give the fire department a credit for every member they could sign up. But no, it was really slow in the early years, the growth was. Depending on where you were located, uh, you'd get a phone in two or three days, usually. But if we had to do outside construction in the rural areas, it might be the next year. We uh, had exchanges at uh, Palmer, Wasilla, Sutton, and Chugiak. And we went as far as Big Lake, you know, with open wire. And we had a pair of wires that went all the way to Eagle River from Chugiak, too, <laughs> that served about a dozen people in Eagle River in those days. Everything was party line at the time because we had two wires going up here. And you can't run two open wire for just one person. So you'd run the open wire up and attach 10 people to it and give them each their, their own ringer code. In the early days, you had to dial what was called a circle digit. And that was a number from, I believe, two to nine that was assigned to everybody on the party line. And so if you had a four party line, for example, somebody would have a two and somebody would have a three, somebody would have a four, and somebody would have a five. So instead of dialing, it's kind of like dialing the one plus now, you had to dial the circle digit. If you dialed the wrong circle digit, the call was billed to the person on your line. It, it was always a problem. Uh, you know, you always had some, some problems. You had a lot of lines that people got along very well, but you had a lot of lines where people didn't. And uh, we, we had a mechanism where we would limit the uh, uh, length of a call that you could make. If you were on a local call, not on a long distance, that you'd get a warning tone at the end of six minutes, I think it was, that said, okay, we're gonna cut you off in another minute. Sometimes Connie would get on and wouldn't get off the phone. <laughs> Pop would get madder than the wet hen. Because sometimes he'd have to call, we had a dairy farm and we used artificial insemination. If a cow went in heat, he had to call the inseminator to get him out there and you had to, you know, Time was of the of an essence, so I remember a couple times Pop stormed up the road to tell her to get off the phone so she wouldn't do it. <laughs> when we uh, first started a long distance call, we would get a handwritten ticket from, at that time, ACS, which was a Alaska communications system owned by the Army. Their operators handled all calls, and they would send us a little piece of paper for every call that had the time and where it went on it and we would manually sort those down to everybody's number and make out a bill. We had to hand bill everybody. The first time we were working on the billing and we brought in all these, you know, envelopes with the business size envelopes with the bills and this little gal trying to teach you, Pat, we have to lick all of those. I said, lick them? She said, yes, we, we have to lick them all. And I was careful. I said, I never heard of such a, what kind of a place, cheap or something. And then she told me she was kidding, so I got to use a sponge. We had some ups and downs even in the 60s, but we were getting started into a steady growth period. A few later, years later, we started the complex that is now on uh, Alaska Street, South Alaska Street, which originally housed the dial equipment with about a, a hut that was about 38 by 40, a concrete block building, which is still hid inside that building complex there today. We did contract with the hotel to do trouble reporting after hours. I had only been there a short time. One night I got a call from Aunt Nuska Electric, and they asked me to turn on their night service because they were closing. Well, I, I thought to myself, what, how do I do something like that? So I ran around and found somebody, and what we had to do is go back into the central office and put a toothpick in the equipment so that the calls would be transferred to the hotel for the night. The first big leap that we made was going to 
very cable facilities, which changed our whole method of providing service, and, and the outages would just go away in the wintertime, or before we would have outages that people would be out of service for days, that you just couldn't get them put back together quick enough. When we went from the Kellogg electromechanical system to a Stromberg Carlson XY switching system that we called it then, it was still a mechanical switching system, but greatly improved. You had to keep them both working right up to one period of time, and then you cut the cables to one and throwed the switches on the other one and cut it over. And it enabled us to do uh, oh, a number of things. One of the big ones is we cut down from uh, you know the eight party lines to no more than four party and a lot more uh, private lines. And uh, it improved our maintenance uh, capabilities on, on the system. Palmer was uh, actually the uh, second big office we cut over. The first one we turned up was uh, in Eagle River, which Eagle River didn't have an office before. It was new. To, uh, telephones were a new thing down in the Eagle River area. Of course, there wasn't much to Eagle River. By the time we cut Eagle River over into service, within a couple of weeks, we were maxed out on the amount of lines that we had available. And there was uh, an addition ordered right away. Chugiak had a little switching center there. We did a small addition on that because we had to have service between the two switches. In the later 60s when the mine shut down, it slowed up. The road only went up to Big Lake. There wasn't a road going to Willow the first few years when I was working here. We just had a small office up there that we purchased from uh, Trans-Alaska was the name of the company. We purchased the one in uh, Willow and Telkeetna, I think probably 64 or 65, but there were, like I said, there was no roads to get in and maintain it. Things were a lot different back then. They had a lot of open wire circuits to maintain, and I mean, they were pretty difficult. A lot of sleet and snow and wind and brush and everything affects the open wire. It isn't like our cables and that are above ground or below ground. You know, they're a lot easier to maintain. Everything was kind of tough, but made it challenging. And well, Cantwell was a, a good one. We, um, you know, cold and windy, and and I get a call at 11 o'clock at night, maybe or something. No dial tone in Cantwell, and so you know it'd be 30 below, and you'd get up there, and the wind would be blowing 30, 40 miles an hour, and two o'clock in the morning maybe, and you get to the switch, and it's just dead or in a macro. We had a generator there, our own had to generate our own power, and so by that time, then the generator's cold and have to prowl around and find somebody that you could get a generator and a heater from to heat the building back up so you could start our generator and get it back on. But that was always fun and kind of challenging. It was frustrating at the time, but you know, you had kind of rewarding, I guess. 7 DGA, they're calling any station. It's an emergency. an emergency. We were quite fortunate. The night of the earthquake, another guy, Rex Earhart, and I, we took off for. Uh, Sutton, I don't know, I think we went up there to check the switch out to make sure that the batteries weren't laying on the floor and things like that. And uh, remember we got up to around the adult camp there on that big curve and the road was standing wide open and uh, of course there a lot of poles that were wiped out and things like that. But I think by the next day we had everything working through there. The landlines between Eagle River and Anchorage went out. Palmer didn't get hit too bad. Uh, Eagle River wiped out my battery plant. Just toppled the batteries. And uh, I, uh, I got everything going as much as I could. And, and had, of course, all the lines of Anchorage were out, but we can make calls within the community. It was an amazing uh, coming together, helping, checking on your neighbor to find out. Uh, I'm just thinking of our neighbors who were quite old and, uh, and how we worried about them. We went into Healy. We took the railroad exchange out and put our own exchange in because Joe used the Billy. In fact, it was kind of an interesting story. I was, I was in Eagle River working as a telephone man, you know, 
and, and I got this phone call, and it was Joe Uzavelli. And I said, what the hell? What's he, what's he want to talk to me about? <laughs> he said, how can I get telephone service up here? And so I talked to him a little bit, and I said, well, why don't you call Max and, and tell Max you talk to me, and then we'll come up and work out a solution. So he called Max, and Max called me back, and we went up, made some arrangements, put in a switch up there. But we went up and plowed cable all the way up to Usabelli. We went up to Vitro, another mining camp up there. And we put telephones all the way up there, and God, they were happy. They had phone service. <laughs> when we had to go up to Healy and cross the river up there, it was, we tried pulling a cable across first with a rod and reel and pull a bigger rope. And then, well, we couldn't cast far enough to get across the river, so finally it was a a bow and arrow, a crossbow, pulled a, a line over. And, and by the time you mess around with this, because you had to walk for miles to get down <laughs> around there, and you probably just waste a day just trying to get a string across. <laughs> and after we got our string pulled across and our rope pulled across, and then we got a big D8 halfway across the river as far as they could go, and then we started pulling cable. It was a project. It wasn't easy, but we did it. In order to get to Healy to do our construction and stuff, we had to put all of our equipment and materials on the railroad and then drive up there through Paxton and across that way because the Parks Highway wasn't, wasn't here yet. Pipeline came along. People didn't have to live in Anchorage. They could live out here. And, of course, the big issue, I think, that changed the whole valley was the highway changing, coming across the flats and becoming a four lane out that far. And every time, I always say, every time you put another overpass in, you bring a bunch of people to the valley. About that time, there wasn't any service at all past Big Lake on up just newly built Parks Highway. We had a crew that plowed cable up toward all the way to Talkeetna. It took them two or three summers to do that. We never buried a large enough cable every time we buried it. I mean, we knew that it was going to grow, but I don't think anybody was aware of how fast some of the outlying areas would grow. This valley really got hit with some major growth. I remember one year that uh, they were talking 20 percent, 26 percent growth. 1975 or 76 is when they built this first portion of this plant building. It was quite a step up from what we had been operating under condition-wise. We got word that somebody else, another local telephone company that was working out of Anchorage or someplace, might be going to put telephones into Taiwanese. And uh, we decided that maybe we should go over and talk to the Taiwanese people. And we convinced them that we would be a, a better company to do it than anybody else. And so they agreed that we could provide telephone service in the village of Taiwanese. They loaded us all up on a barge out at uh, Connect Goose Bay with cable, pedestals, my splicing trucks, small cable plow, backhoe, a couple of pickup trucks. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning the next day, they dropped us off on the beach. Spent two or three weeks plowing cable for the first time for all these folks. And I think, you know, they might have had one or two phones at the time. And we were able to deliver, a, you know, put a phone to everybody's house. And, you know, and it was exciting because people, they couldn't wait for MTA to get there. They treated us like kings. And, and um, you know, we loved <laughs> giving them something that they didn't have. It was a big deal when we got 1,000 <laughs> and when we got to 10,000. It was, uh, yes, it was a, a matter of pride for all of us, I think, you know, from the board of directors down to all the employees. We called up, got phone service, and then we got a phone call saying, hey, you guys were the 10,000th phone in the valley. We went, oh, cool, okay. <laughs> they said we could pick out any phone that they had, so we picked out this uh, old-style candlestick phone which we thought looked really cool, and we discovered really quickly that it was a real pain to use. So because, because you couldn't get up and walk with it, or you couldn't, you know, you, you had to sit right there and talk into that horn and hold the thing up to your ear, and 
we decided, well, it did look cool, but it wasn't very practical. I started in 1977. When I came to work here, we were six months behind. South of the Knick River, towards Eagle River, we had approximately 6,000 subscribers at that time. And Eagle River itself, probably 4,000 people. It was pretty small back then. A lot of the development that we've got today didn't exist. The business boulevard area of town was an old farm. It was almost overwhelming the amount of work that we had to do. Just getting to some of those places was a challenge. Engineering kept cranking out work. The line crews kept digging and putting it in, extending it, and then the splicer splicing it up, and we'd come along right behind them and uh, do our installation work. I can remember um, as a field engineer getting in my truck and having 25 new service orders and having to go out and chase, you know, all across the valley, um, you know, those 25 service orders, and, and then getting there the next day and there's 25 more sitting there. We were growing fast and we were dealing with the so-called deregulation. Uh, the union was flexing their muscles and had elected people to the board of directors, which created problems for me and the board of directors at times. Uh, it, um, it wasn't as much fun as it was in the early days. It was still a challenge. We got into the conversion to the digital world and got that pretty well along with a great deal of pride. We had projects planned to go to the next generation of fiber optics. It kept us busy. We had a few years where we experienced, you know, 30% growth, where we would install uh, uh, hundreds of telephones and literally hundreds of miles of cable uh, every summer for a 10-year period there almost. It used to be when you moved out to the valley, you pretty much kissed any kind of decent television reception goodbye because you were picking up broadcast uh, up off of the, um, out of Anchorage. And it wasn't very good. I mean, we're, out, we're on the fringe areas. Basically, the people that we were serving in some of these areas had lousy TV or no TV. You go in the Butte area or you go in the Alpine Sutton area and in some of those areas, uh, you go up to Hatcher Pass area where we were serving with telephone service, and they didn't have TV. And so I think, and we had a lot of people requesting it. We had to, you know, put in a different cable system. We put in the antennas that you see standing today down at the other site, and one in Wasilla. And we did not have the right to put cable in Eagle River. That was in the city of Anchorage. But we had to recruit people, train people in the art of cable TV. As a matter of fact, I think we got the first nationwide exemption. I'm sure we did for a telephone co-op to provide cable TV. I had put together MacTel with the uh, city of Anchorage. We had a presence in Anchorage through our Eagle River ownership. So that gave us a right to provide the cellular service. MacTel was named by MTA employees, and then finally the company sold half of that to ACS, and then as a partnership. And along the way, there there were a few folks that sold some very valuable assets out from under this this uh, association. <laughs> It wasn't until Tom came that he said, you know, time out, it's time we built the building that's going to uh, uh, be here for 30 years. And, and I know there was a lot of <laughs> consternation about this building and, and, oh my gosh, this glass palace and, and especially in Little Palmer, uh, the landscape. And so we accumulated the cash. We didn't borrow to build this building. We took us three or four or five years to accumulate enough cash and, and we built it. This was a good example of what God could do if he had the money. So, you know, we've, it helps to get, you know, your people in one place, and, and we've become a lot more efficient, a lot more efficient. I guess it was always in the back of my mind that, and, and partially just from the knowledge that 
you know, to be a strong company, you, you needed to grow. Now you can run a DSL digital subscriber line, which, carries, which can carry your, your broadband, can carry data, and your voice. And now DSL is now expanding into video. Probably our greatest accomplishment is we've been able to handle periods of high growth, and we're still in periods of high growth, actually very well. A lot of a lot of organizations just come apart when that happens. They can't handle it. I think we've handled that very well. I couldn't be prouder of the job MTA's done, and um, you know continues to do it. It it, um, it is a huge cornerstone to this community and will continue to be. And I've said before, you know, our mission is for our kids as kids to have this company and, um, and to really be um, the example that other people can look at and go, you know, that is what a company should be all about. Mm -hmm.